right, so this lecture is the sort of second half of the lecture we're doing on this week on recovery in, in our database system. So the last class was everything about, about logging, how do you write out all the changes to that transaction you're making at runtime. And then now today's class is about taking checkpoints. And we need to do this because we don't want to process the entire log whenever we turn the system back on. So this is allows us to take a snapshot and recover from that. So real quick before we get started, uh, there's sort of three things coming up for you guys in the course. As I said last class, on uh, Wednesday in class next week, uh, we will have the midterm exam. I sent out the, the announcement on Piazza about the, what's expected, and then I'll provide you guys with the study guide uh, this weekend. The second thing is that project two is due on the Monday during spring break at midnight. Uh, as at least from a, yesterday, it didn't look like anybody had actually submitted anything on Autolab. Uh, so I advise you to do that, um, or just don't wait until the, the, the midterm and then do it. That's, you're not going to have a good time. Um, do not disappear in spring break without doing the project. Uh, first year I taught this course, somebody did that because their girlfriend broke up with them and wanted to go to spring break in Miami. They failed the class. Don't do that. Okay. And then the other thing is that uh, I'll post the, uh, the project page maybe this weekend, early next week. Uh, but you guys are going to have to do the, your, your proposal for project three the first Monday after spring break. So on Monday's class next week, I'll spend some time at the end talking about the different project topics you could explore. Some of you already started your projects by working with, with their group, uh, and I've already sort of thrown out some other ideas, but I'll go through in sort of a bit more detail about here's the things you, you could work on. And if you go back to the 2017 or the 2016 uh, versions of the course website, there's a project showcase link. You can see the type of projects that other students have done. Okay? Uh, so for this, I'll post on Piazza a link to the spreadsheet uh, again, I'll, I'll make a spreadsheet on the, on the Google Doc that says, here's how to sign up for your, you know, your group and what, what your project topic is. Um, if I haven't talked to you already, you might want to send me an email and say, hey, look, I'm thinking about doing this. Is this going to be okay or something like that? Unless it's one of the ones I've, I've given you ahead of time, um, you may want to check with me first before you propose something. Okay? And then on this Monday, everyone, in the, you know, I think we'll have to do spend five, six minutes, come up here and... Uh, Give the pitch about what you're at, it is that you're going to do. And these proposals should not just be like, hey, I think this is kind of cool. I think I want to do it. Uh, you're going to actually want to look in the code, maybe not understand everything, and, but have a rough idea of like, here's the files, or here's, here's, here's where I think I'm going to have to make my changes. Or here's some, some feature I'm going to need that, that doesn't exist yet. Okay? Any questions about any of these things? Blank stairs. Okay. Cool. Uh, all right, so so let's start uh, getting the material for today. So, right, so so today we're going to talk about checkpoints. And again, the idea here is that we want to take a snapshot of what's in memory and write it out the disk, uh, or write it some location. It may not actually have to be disk. And then that way, if we restart our database system, we can load that back in instead of having to replay the entire log. So we'll spend most of our time talking about doing checkpoints or recovery. Uh, this was in the paper you guys read, and this is what most people think of when they think of checkpoints. But then I want to spend a little time talking at the end about a technique from Facebook, which I think is really clever, about using shared memory to write your checkpoints so that you can restart the server very quickly. Okay? So, as we said last class, uh, the, the, the database system logging scheme is necessary because we want to be able to re recover the database system uh, after a crash. And to do this, unless we have checkpoints, we're basically going to have to replay the entire log. And as we said before, depending on what logging scheme you're using, physical logging versus logical logging, this may actually take a long time. So if you have a one-year log and it took you one year to process that log, when you turn the system back on, you're going to have to take another year to, to put the database back into the correct state. And that's not good because your system is essentially useless. So what checkpoints are going to allow us to do is Basically, the system can say, I know I have a checkpoint that's, that's on disk at this point in time. And therefore, I don't have to, to replay anything in, in the log, uh, modulo, you know, some, some, maybe a few transactions, but I don't have to replay anything in the log that came before this checkpoint. Anything afterwards I want to replay, because that was what the state database was doing right up to the point I restarted. 
But the checkpoint basically allows me to truncate the log and I can ignore everything before then. And that's going to dramatically speed up our, our recovery process. So for an MRE checkpoint, at a high level, it's essentially the same thing that you would do in a disk or an database system, um, where you're basically, again, taking the contents of memory, writing it out to disk, you know, some, some set of files on disk. In a disk-oriented system, what they're going to do for checkpoints is they're essentially just writing out any dirty pages in the buffer pool out the disk to the heap file for, for that database. But now for an in-memory database, we don't have, we don't have a heap file uh, that we're maintaining. We don't have a buffer pool. We don't have any notion of dirty pages. So we're essentially going to write out all the data, all our blocks of tuples. Um, we'll see when we talk about delta checkpoints, this may not always be the case. Um, but in general, that's what you're going to do. Basically, you have the contents of the data in memory, and then I'm going to plop it down to a, to a file on disk. Right? And the, the how you're actually going to implement this is going to be actually really tightly coupled to what concurrent control scheme you're using. Or maybe put it a different way, if you're doing multi-versioning already to do multi-version concurrent control, whether it's timestamp ordering or two-phase locking, then you can, you can rely on that in some ways to, to make your checkpoints go really, really fast. Or just use that as your, as, to take your checkpoint. Um, if you're doing in-place updates, like in the HStore or VoltDB scheme we talked about last time, then you're, you're going to have to do some, some extra stuff. And essentially the way a checkpoint works is that you just have some number of threads in your system that when the checkpoint starts, it starts scanning all, all the tables uh, and preparing these, these blocks of, you know, of, of, of the checkpoint data and then writing them out to, to, to the disk. Now, unlike in logging, where if a transaction committed, we have to do an f-sync, we care about you know, having everything be synchronous, we have to do an f-sync and make sure our buffers get flushed and written to disk for real before we can send the acknowledgement back to the application that we successfully committed. In the case of the checkpoint threads, we don't have to do this. We can just tell it to do you know, a flush and let the operating system decide or the disk controller decide when to actually schedule these out because if we crash uh, in the middle of a checkpoint, the checkpoint's invalid anyway. I mean, at the very last write, we, we want to do f-sync, make sure our checkpoint is truly written out. But as we're doing this, right, we don't have to make sure we're doing f-sync every single time. So this makes it a little bit easier for the operating system to schedule when they actually want to do writes actual to the, to the physical hardware. So for the, the paper you guys read and this other paper from the guys at Yale in 2016, uh, they came up with some, some sort of uh, edicts or, or properties that they want any checkpoint implementation or checkpoint scheme to have for an in-memory database. And in some way, these, these are kind of obvious, but I want to go through them because when we start talking about the different checkpointing schemes, uh, we can use these to make decisions about whether this was a good idea or not, or wh whether they make the right design cho choices in their implementation. All right? So the first one is that uh, while we're taking our checkpoints, we, would, we don't want it to slow down the regular transaction processing. In some ways, this is going to be unavoidable. Right? In the case of Silo R, when they were checking checkpoints with TPCC, that's a real insert-heavy workload. And so they saw about a 10 to 50% drop in, in performance while you're taking a checkpoint. That's usually the, the range you want to be in, 10 to 15%. You know, if it was like 50%, all of a sudden, you know, my machine is, is you know, performance cut in half because I take a checkpoint, that's bad. So we don't want to do that. Um, and related to this, we also don't want to introduce any unacceptable uh, increases in, in our transaction latency or query latency while we're taking a checkpoint. Um, and this will come up when we start talking about the weight-free or uh, components so, or the weight-free checkpointing schemes that can avoid having to do long pauses that block all threads while, while we're taking the checkpoint. And the last one is obviously is always you know, important because we're in an in-memory database environment. Uh, we want to avoid excessive memory overhead. Uh, meaning, ideally, we don't want to have to make you know, multiple copies of the database while we take our checkpoint. Now, in the, the ping pong thing, a ping pong protocol that you guys read about, they're making three copies of the database. In my opinion, that's unacceptable, and nobody actually implements that. Um, in the worst case of zigzag, they have to take, they take two copies. But for the other schemes we'll see, uh, it'll be much, much less. Right? And we're already, again, in multi-version concurrent control, we're already making multiple versions anyway. So the nice thing got again at MVCC is like we're going to pay this penalty to make new versions, uh, but we can just use those versions to take our checkpoints. All right, so there's going to be three things, three uh, different sort of categories or, or, or um, 
yeah, I guess categories of checkpointing schemes that we can talk about. So the first one is whether it's doing uh, a consistent checkpoint or a fuzzy checkpoint. So the, the paper you guys read, the, all of those checkpointing protocols are what are called consistent checkpoints. And what this means is that it's just like under snapshot isolation when we talked about timestamp ordering before, the checkpoint file that's being written out the disk is a consistent snapshot of the database at some point in time. Meaning in our checkpoint, we will not see any changes from transactions that were actively running and made modifications to the database but had not committed yet while we've taken the checkpoint, right? And so the, the again, when you think of the context of, of, of snapshot isolation, think of it being the exact same thing, but now we're writing out the disk. And the advantage of this is that when we turn the system back on, right, and we load this checkpoint in, we actually don't have to do any extra work to figure out uh, what, are, what are the transactions that may have not committed and therefore we should roll back their changes because they're, they're stored in our checkpoint, right? Now contrast this with fuzzy checkpoints where you do have this problem, uh, or you do have this issue. Uh, and so fuzzy checkpoints is the most common checkpointing scheme used in disk-based systems. This is what Aries does that we talked about last class. The idea, again, is we, when we start a checkpoint, we don't pause or stop any other transactions. We uh, let them continue running. But then we may end up having uh, updates from uncommitted transactions reflected in, in, in our, the page of data. And furthermore, we actually may see for a transaction that maybe does later commit, we only see half its changes in our checkpoints and the other half, uh, the other half are in the log and the other half are, are actually everything's in the log. Half of them made it to the checkpoint, half of them didn't. So we have to resolve that. So that's why in the case of Aries, they have to do multiple passes over the log because they have to deal with the fact that they have a fuzzy checkpoint. And so what they end up doing to make this work is you have to record some extra information in the log of when the checkpoint starts and when, check, when the checkpoint finishes. And if you're a disk-based system, you keep track of like, what are the dirty pages? What are my active, actively running transactions? And you can use that as, as a guide to figure out what was going on in the system, why you're taking the checkpoint. In the case of a consistent uh, checkpoint, you don't have to do this. You say, at this point in time, I'm taking my checkpoint and I don't see anything that came, uh, that for anything that was running at the time I was doing this. Yes. Does it mean that consistent checkpoints always required for like for the transactions? Your, your question is: Does this mean consistent checkpoints are always required for what? Uh, for the transactions. His, his question is: Does this mean for consistent che checkpoints, do I always have to pause transactions? No. So again, if you're well, if you're doing multi versioning, think of the checkpoint as just doing a select star query on a table as a read only transaction. You get your snapshot. You get your timestamp. And now you have, you'll be guaranteed you have a consistent snapshot. You don't see anything from uncommitted transactions. And you just scan through everything and you write that out to disk. Now, what it does do, it does prevent the garbage collector from cleaning things up. Because if your checkpoint takes an hour to write, to, to write out, you have, a, you have an open transaction for an hour. It won't block anybody else from reading and writing. It just blocks the garbage collector from, from, from cleaning things up. So you may have a spike in memory at that point. All right. Um, Okay, yeah, so again, in the way the fuzzy checkpoints, actually, the one thing I want to point out here is that, uh, I'm not saying this explicitly, but I'm telling you this is how it works. When you take the checkpoint, you write a log entry that says, I'm taking a checkpoint at this time. In the case of consistent checkpoints, you can just say, it's, it's at this time. Um, in the case of fuzzy checkpoints, you, you have the beginning, the, the stop and the stop, start and stop time for the checkpoint. Yes? So is it like uh, associated with MGCC? Is what, is what associated? So his question is, does consistent checkpoint, does this only work if you have MVCC? No, we'll see an example where you don't. All right, so the next question we have to deal with is, what do we actually store in our checkpoints? So the most obvious one is that it is a complete checkpoint, meaning for every single table and every single tuple, it gets written out to my checkpoint. Right? And typically this could be done, every, the checkpoint is, will be a single file. Right? If it's a single node database, it's often a single file and that file represents the, the, the checkpoint. So the, the advantage of this is that when you crash and come back, you just one file, you know that you, you, you need to read it to put the database back in the, uh, the load the last checkpoint in. Um, the downside is obvious that if, you, if your database is 100 gigabytes, and since the last checkpoint you only modified one gigabyte, you're gonna write out all 100 gigabytes every single time, all right? The alternative is to do a delta checkpoint, which is essentially solves the problem I just said, where instead of writing out the entire database in your checkpoint, you just write out the things that actually got changed. 
And you can do like a bitmap and keep track of, you know, here's the things that actually got modified and only write those things out. So I would say for uh, the in-memory databases that we'll talk about, the only one that actually does this is Microsoft Hecaton um, the, the, in SQL Server, their, their in-memory database engine. Everybody pretty much does this. Um, part of the reason I think is because from a, at sort of a human standpoint, like uh, from, from a person that actually has to manage the software, it gives people sort of a sense of satisfaction or comfort knowing that like, here's my single checkpoint file that I, I can be guaranteed that this is, this is in my entire database. Whereas if you have deltas, then you got to go back and, and figure out like, all right, well, make sure I replay all my checkpoints and put, get, make sure I get everything. So an example I said before where if I have a, if I, you know, I have a 100 gigabyte database, if I first load that 100 gigabyte database in and then I only make modifications to one gigabyte over time, I need to make sure that when I load all my checkpoints back in, I go back to the very first checkpoint and bring that in because otherwise my, my data could go missing. Um, and so in the case of Hecaton, they do some extra work to like merge these things so that you, you, you avoid having to go back every time. But for again, a lot of people like the idea of having a single checkpoint file that you could then ship around or, or you know, save in a, in a single location uh, and make sure that everything is always persistent. But for, there's obvious performance reasons why uh, you'd want to do this. Now, a research question would be, can you actually combine these things? And I don't know the answer. I mean, I'm assuming you could, but it, is it actually feasible? Like, could you take a complete checkpoint every 10 minutes and then a delta checkpoint every minute? Yes? For delta checkpoints, do you actually, like, update the place, or you just add, like, a delta record somewhere? So his question is, for the delta checkpoint, do you update the tuple in place, or do you add a delta record there? Yeah, so let me be clear here. Um, every time I take a new checkpoint, I write a new file, right? So in this case here, in my Delta checkpoint, like I'll have the one for now, and then for 10 minutes later, that'll be another directory, another set of files to take my checkpoint there. And then depending on what the system is actually, how you configure it, it can know that like, all right, well, I don't need to keep my checkpoints from five days ago, so I can start pruning those. In the case of Hecaton, they can be clever about merging things so that like, you know, two 10 minute checkpoints one after another combines it to a single file. And that, you know, for ease of manageability and also makes it faster to recover. Yes? So that's actually a very good point. So his statement is, can we think of the delta checkpoint as just a batch of logs? Yes. Again, so in, the, in I guess I should have made a whole slide about how heck that does this. But they basically, they have a log file. Everyone always has a log file. Then their checkpoints are actually two files. One is a, like another log file that says, here's all the versions I've inserted. And then another log file says, here's all the versions I've deleted. And they know how to reconcile, coalesce them and reconcile them to then put the database back in the correct state. Right? You can sort of think of it as like a, a condensed log. Right? Yeah. And if you have a separate machine that can take the data to checkpoint and consolidate it into a complete checkpoint. Yeah, so his, his statement is, uh, or his question is, can you have a replica, another machine, feed in not just the delta, not the, just the checkpoints, but actually the, the the log itself. Can you have it replay the log and and reconstruct the database? Yes, this is essentially. I mean, again, this is, this is another topic. I was like, man, I should do replication, but like, I don't think I could do a whole lecture one. I, I guess I probably could, but um, essentially, how replication mostly works in these systems uh, is it just streams out the the write ahead log, and then the other machines, the replicas, are essentially always in recovery mode. And there's always replaying and updating the database. And then you have to do a little extra work to know that, like, all right, well, if I committed my transaction and I wrote these log records, not only do I have to make sure that's flushed to disk, but I want to make sure that's flushed to my replica and I got a response. And there's different ways, there's, you can set different things like how much, does it have to really be installed to the other machine or do you, do you just, as long as they get the packets, is that enough? There's different settings you can do with that. Okay. All right, so the last issue we got to deal with is how often we should take checkpoints. So this should be sort of obvious, right? If we take a checkpoint too often, then uh, this is going to cause our runtime performance to, to degrade. And they guess a hackathon, or not hackathon, sorry, in Silo, they were basically check, taking checkpoints all the time. And then when the, when the checkpoint ended, they wait 10 seconds and then fire up another one. Um, but again, as you saw in the case of TPCC, there was a 10% you know, a, a overhead for, while taking a checkpoint. Uh, so the alternative is you know, you know wait longer, but waiting too long is a bad idea because now if you only take a checkpoint every day, 
if you crash, uh, then it's going to take a longer time for you to recover. Now, as, as I said last class, or I said just now, typically, if you're an in-memory system, you're, if you're running an in-memory database, and you're running like a million transactions a second, that's a serious OTP application. So you probably have money, right? Because you know, who, why else would you be running you know that many transactions? So you can afford to have replicas. You can afford to stream out your Red Hat log and replay them and fail over so that fail over to the replica whenever the master crashes, so you, that you don't have to reload the entire checkpoint and replay the log. Um, but still, you know, the whole data center could go down, and, and you will have to do this. And you want to cut down your minimize your 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 downtime. So. There's no magic rule I can tell you say, hey, set your thing to do this, right? It depends on what, what kind of performance guarantees you want and what the, uh, how much tolerance you have for being down, right? If you're paranoid and can have zero downtime, then you probably will be willing to pay a performance penalty by taking checkpoints more often. But if you're like, all right, well, we don't fail that often, and if it does, whatever, it's, it's Saturday night, nobody's using the website. So in that case, I'm okay with taking checkpoints less frequently. Right? So in terms of like when do you actually want to take a checkpoint, or how, what, what, what is the mechanism to trigger a checkpoint, uh, there's essentially two approaches that, that you can use to, at runtime to figure this out. And the last one I'll say on shutdown, this is pretty much everyone does. Right? You have to do this. Right? If, you, if you send a shutdown command to the database server, the system says, all right, I'm going down. Let me take a checkpoint, write all my contents of memory out the disk, and then I can actually finish. Right? You don't want to do a kill dash nine because that's going to ruin ruin your day. Right? Uh, so this is sort of a clean way. Uh, this is the clean way to shut down is just take 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 the checkpoint and then shut down. All right. So the two approaches are time based or log file size based. So time based is obvious. Right? You basically say I take a checkpoint every five minutes, every ten minutes, whatever whatever you set it to be. And then the log file size basically says when I've written this amount of data out to my log file, so like my write ahead log, then I'll go ahead and take a checkpoint. So for a MemSQL, for example, theirs is a, is a quarter gig. So if I write out 250, 250 meg megabytes to my log, that will trigger a checkpoint. All right, and the next time I do this, I, I take another checkpoint. So the, this table here is a sort of summary that, that I came up with about uh, the major in-memory database systems that are out there that support checkpoints and how they actually do it. So the first thing I'll also point out is that pretty much everybody except for Hecaton, as I said, takes complete uh, checkpoints, right? There'll be some file or set of files that'll be a complete copy of the, of the entire contents of the database. And the case of, of Hecaton, as I said to him earlier, it's going to be like the, here's all the versions I've just inserted, and here's all the versions I deleted. It's like two log files, and they, they can combine them together. And then in terms of like when they actually take a checkpoint, it, you can see that it's, it's, it's uh, all the systems do different things, right? In the case of times 10, uh, we'll see this with a do a consistent checkpoint that blocks all transactions when you shut down the system, but then during net regular runtime, they'll do one that's time-based, uh, and that'll actually be a fuzzy checkpoint. Both of these uh, time-based, MemSQL is log-based, HANA is log-based, or sorry, Hecaton is log-based, and HANA is time-based. So in terms of also now the type of checkpoints, again, Alta-base is going to be doing fuzzy checkpoints, um, and this is sort of expected because they're doing, they're doing uh, two-phase locking. Same thing for times 10. Um, but you would think that, as I've been saying uh, so far, that like MVCC makes it really easy to do consistent checkpoints because it's just snaps out isolation. So what's interesting to point out is HANA is an MVCC system, and they do fuzzy checkpoints. And then VoltDB is not an MVCC system, and they do consistent checkpoints. So you still can do consistent checkpoints even though you don't do MVCC. And the way both of these are going to do this, we'll see in a second, they actually basically slip, switch into a multi-version mode only when you do a checkpoint. But it's not actually multi-version, it's only two versions. But the basic idea is the same. Uh, Peloton does not do checkpoints. It's a work in progress. Hyper, as of this morning, they told me they, they don't do checkpoints because I couldn't find any paper that describes this. Um, so this, you need to have this in a commercial system. For an academic system, you can get by without it. But we, we'd like to have this. Yes? Does Manu mean like sending a command explicitly? Oh, sorry, yeah, manual. So I, I looked in the documentation for AltaBase like this weekend. I can't tell what the hell actually they're doing, right? Like they just, like, so there's always going to be some command that you can give, like in a SQL terminal says, take a checkpoint. HANA calls it save point, other systems call it checkpoint, right? Basically, you're telling them, like, take a checkpoint now. 
so the Altabase manual describes that here's how to do this right, as a DBA, but then there's nothing that says how to tune it to do it every so often. So I, I don't know. Presumably, they've been around for 30, 20, 20, 30 years that they would have something that's automated. Right? Time based is the easiest one. Every five minutes, take a checkpoint. Right? But I couldn't find anything that says how to do it. I mean, maybe I just missed it. OK. So now I want to go through the, uh, the different checkpoint uh, approaches you can have that was in the paper you guys read. So the, the first thing I'll say is that all these implementations here are consistent checkpoints. Um, because again, in some ways, this is easier for us to reason about. And only really uh, Microsoft does the Delta checkpoints for their in-memory database. Um, the second thing I'll say, too, is that nobody actually implements these two, as far as I know. right? And, and it should be pretty obvious when you read the paper, like, wow, this is really overly complicated. right? Um, the approach number two is, is going to be the most common one. Um, and the third thing I'll say, too, is that the, the paper I had you guys read, it's, it's from Sigmod, so it's a database conference. Um, but they don't use terminology that they, they use terminology that doesn't exactly match up with everything we said so far in the semester and everything we'll say uh, for the rest of the semester, right? They talk about having to like checkpoint application state, right? And that sort of seems kind of you know it's not exactly what we've been talking about. But you can think of the application state as just it's just the in-memory database, right? And so in their environment, they are imagining something where you have application state in memory. And it may be part of a larger sub, uh, database that's out on disk, and you want to take checkpoints for the in-memory part. For our purposes, it's just the, the application state is the in-memory database. And so we can, see, we can apply all the, these same techniques. Okay? All right, so the first one is do naive, check, or naive snapshots. And basically how this is going to work is that we're just going to create a, like the dumbest implementation of creating a consistent snapshot of the database. Um, and we basically, for every single thing we want to checkpoint, we make a copy of it. We block all the transactions, make a copy of it, and then we write that copy out to disk. And once we have our copy, then we can let any, you know anybody else can then operate. So whether you you block the entire system while you do this checkpoint, or you do it on a per block basis, or you maybe run it as a transaction that takes you know, exclusive locks on the data you're, you're trying to uh, checkpoint, it, it it doesn't matter. Um, actually, that, that wouldn't work because you have to you have to block everything to make sure that nobody updates anything. Um, so there's two approaches to do this. You can do it yourself, meaning again, you lock the entire database and you just scan all your tuples and you just write them out, uh, write, write, you know, write them out to some region of memory and then start writing them out to the checkpoint. Um, this is obviously bad because you're blocking everything while you, while you do this. And then the other approach is actually a pretty clever idea uh, where you let the operating system do everything for you or, or write out all, all, your entire checkpoint. The issue is going to be, though, is that when you do it yourself, you can be careful about only copying tuple data. But when you let the operating system do it, uh, the operating system doesn't know what, what's tuple memory versus what's indexes versus what's internal data structures. right? So it ends up making a copy of everything. So this is the approach that actually Hyper did originally. So the, the version of Hyper we've been talking about so far Right? The art index stuff, the, the compilation system, the, the multi-version curve control, like that's sort of like the next, the second version of Hyper. The original version of Hyper, what they would was actually based heavily on the HDRVoltDB system that we were building in New England. Um, and they sort of borrowed some ideas that we had where you were doing these single thread execution engines to execute transactions. But the problem with the single threaded engine approach is that it's really fast for transactions that are doing small changes, but if you have to do an analytical query that has to read large, large portions of the database, then that's going to be really slow because you have to lock all these partitions at every single node or every single core, then do your read, and then, you know, then, then you're done. And that, so you're blocking all other transactions from, from running at the same time. So the way the hyper guys got around it was they would fork the database process and then that would create a, uh, you know, a, a new child process that had a copy of the contents of memory from the parent process. And they could run their analytical queries on, on the child process and take a checkpoint of the database and write that as a, as a disk from the child process. So when you do a fork in the operating system, it's gonna, the, the child process needs to have an exact copy of the, of the contents of the memory from the parent process. But rather than doing that copy immediately when you do the fork, they actually do a copy on write. So they map the, 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 the physical pages of virtual memory 
to be the same in, from the child process and the parent process. So only when now you start one of those processes starts modifying the, uh, the, the pages in memory, then it actually does a copy and make real, real separate pages. So they, what they did with the clever, which I think was really clever, they basically figured out, oh, well, if we fork the process, now we have a consistent, well, a, a somewhat consistent snapshot of, of the database. There may have been active transactions running when you did the fork, so they had to go look in the in-memory undo logs for those transactions, which are now technically aborted on the child process, roll back their changes, and now they have a consistent snapshot. And they can then run the analytical queries that, uh, that they want on, on, the, um, on, on the child process, or they can have the, the checkpoint thread to scan through and write everything out. So again, the nice thing about this is like, other than having to do this little extra work of rolling back it, transactions that were actively running on the, on the parent when you did the fork, you don't have to do anything special, right? The operating system does everything for you. Of course, now the downside is that uh, since the parent process is still going to continue processing transactions, uh, it's going to start modifying memory and the operating system is going to have to start making copies of those pages and updating them, right? Because the child process shouldn't see them. And so for tuples, so, so the changes that the parent process is going to make is not just for the tuple data, it's also the indexes, it's also like, you know, networking buffers, like everything that, that you need for your system to actually run is going to start getting updated and the operating system has to start copying it. So this is, again, I think this is a really nice approach, uh, but the, they eventually switched and got rid of this, this, this approach and switched over to use MVCC and manage everything themselves because the operating system, uh, the, the overhead in the operating system was too much. So when I first started at CMU, I thought this was, was a clever idea. Uh, and we actually tried implementing, implementing this in our own system, or the system I built in grad school, the HDOR system. So I had a master student try it out. Uh, and we weren't doing the checkpoint thing. We were just trying to see whether uh, we could do the, the, do, do the forking and run the analytical process. So this is running the TPCC workload on a single machine uh, with eight warehouses. And the red line is HDOR running without the forks. And then the red line is the HDOR with, with the ability to do forks on the child process. So one big difference between HDOR and Hyper is that Hyper is written entirely in C++. HDOR is a combination of Java and C++. So the, all the front end was in Java, like for the networking layer, the catalogs, the transaction processing. And then the back end data, like the execution engine, the storage manager for the system was all in C++. So we'd use J and I to communicate between Java and C++. This is before like the off heap stuff or like the cogen stuff with Scala and Spark became uh, was in vogue. This is like 2007 we did this. So uh, if you go read the manual for the JVM, they explicitly say do not fork it, right? It says you're gonna have a bad time when you, if you do this. Um, and this is because when you fork, the only thread that's still alive in the child process is whatever the, the forking, whatever the process, that, the thread that actually called the fork. So in the JVM, in a managed memory environment, there's all this other crap that runs in the background, like the garbage collector and other you know, event threads. So those things don't get spawned in, in the child process. So basically you have this, this JVM process that's like a half dead zombie, because you have the one thread that you, that you forked with, but everything else that you need is actually dead, right? So uh, this is why they say don't do this. Um, and the other tricky thing too is like you have to make sure that um, any lock you hold from a thread, uh, that th there's no thread holding that lock when you go to a uh, fork because you're not going to be able to unlock it on the other side uh, in the child process. We <laughs> do it anyway. Uh, and so what you see here is uh, there's two blips. Right, the correspond here. And this is when we're running TPCC normally, and then we run uh, an analytical query. And again, so you see in the case of the blue line, the performance basically goes to zero because we're not processing any transactions. We, we have to lock the entire cluster or the entire machine at every partition in order to execute this analytical query because that's how HDORS concurrency protocol worked. Right? And so you see the dip here and here. In the case of the, um, uh, for the snapshot, you see, again, you pay this, this penalty where the Parent process is still processing transactions, so that's why it doesn't go to zero. It's still kind of uh, it's still alive, trying to do stuff. But now, because the transactions are updating things, the JVM on the parent process is running the garbage collector, so it starts re reorganizing the, the layout memory in the heap. The OS starts copying all our pages, so that's why you see even after like the analytical query is done, uh, 
it's it still has a time to take a while to catch up because at this point the the this point whatever changes we've made have diverged enough uh, for the garbage collector and the parent process so we don't the OS stops copying things. But then when you come execute the, the second OLAP query, you don't have to pay that forking cost, um, and it's actually able to sustain performance. So again, the in this toy example here, this looks okay. Other than it's being un really unreliable, you wouldn't actually want run, run this production. But in the case of the hyper guys, they saw that this was, it was an unacceptable slowdown in their case because uh, the operating system doesn't know that, oh, this is something that I don't need to propagate or make a new page over on, on, on the other thing, on the, on the child process. All right, so the, the next approach, which is more common, is to do copy on update snapshots. And again, this could be either through uh, Using, leveraging the fact we're using MVCC to have, we, we have multiple versions and we just know how to take a snapshot of the database based on those versions, or we can do something manual uh, if, we're, if we're not a multi-versioning system. So basically, again, it's just multi-versioning. So anytime we, we start a checkpoint, when a transaction modifies data, we're going to create new copies of it ourselves and write to that rather than overwriting the thing that the, che that the checkpoint thread is trying to read, rather than overwriting the tuple the checkpoint thread is trying to read. Right? And again, this is basically the same thing as the, the copy and write snapshot with forking and hyper, except here the data system do, is doing everything itself, which is always the better idea. So you can have the copies you generate be at different granularities. It could be on a per block basis, a per tuple, right? Typically everyone does it on a per tuple basis. And then what happens when the checkpoint thread starts running, anytime it sees something that was created after it started, because right, the checkpoint thread is essentially going to run as a transaction too, so it's going to have a timestamp. It's going to have a way to order itself with every other transaction running at the same time. It just knows that anything that was created after I started, I can ignore. All right? Yes. Can you go back to just like this one? Yeah. Okay. Is it right before the workflow switched to the OLAP and it starts to do the like, uh, So so it's it's always running TPCC. Always. It's just that these two time ticks, an OLAP query showed up, and the system said, I have to execute this. So right before the like, OLAP query, it begins to do the checkpoints. No. So, so, this, so this is not... Think of it, it's forking the process. So yes, it's like taking a snapshot. Yes. So, or a checkpoint. Uh, so it's when the query shows up, then it takes the checkpoint. So we, like... The way the hyper did it was, if you see you have a read-only query and you can estimate how much data is going to estimate access, if it should be, if it's better to run that on the the, the child process. They would then uh, either fork one if they didn't have one, or they would basically say, I already know I have a, I have a child process forked, and they would just route the query to run over there. So that's what we're doing here. So we, the first time it shows up, we do the fork, and that's what you see in the red line this huge drop, and then it takes a while for it to get back back up. When the second query shows up, we know that we have a fork. And it's okay for us to go run run on it. So now, the fork process is not going to get any of the updates that the the the, the regular the parent process is still running. In an OLAP system, that's probably okay, right? In an OLAP system, in this case here, I'm running this 20 seconds later. The fact that I'm running my query and it's reading 20 second old data, it's probably okay. If I really cared about having you know up to up to the you know millisecond accuracy then I'd pay the penalty to have the performance drop. Okay. So what VoltDB does, so VoltDB, again, the, the H-Store VoltDB model is a, uh, a single version system uh, doing in-place updates. And so it's really, really fast uh, to do transactions that don't have to touch multiple partitions because when you're running at a single thread, you nobody else, nobody else is running at the same time, so there's no locks and latches, there's nothing, there's no concurrent control you actually have to do while the transaction is running. Uh, but when now you want to take a checkpoint, uh, the system will, will tell every single execution engine, we're now taking a checkpoint, so switch into this copy on, copy on write mode, or copy on update. And then what happens is that anytime a uh, tuple, uh, any time a transaction updates a tuple, instead of overwriting the existing one, it just makes a new version of it. right? And it doesn't actually have to update it doesn't have to create a version chain like you do in MVCC. All the pointers in your index will now point to your new version, uh, and you'll never actually be able to see the old version. It's just when the, 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 the checkpoint thread is essentially doing a sequential scan, it'll find the, the old version that it wants, and it can ignore the newer versions. 
So, all in, so in this environment, it's essentially a two-version system. You have the old one, you have the version of the tuple that existed before the checkpoint started, and then you have the, the newer version after the checkpoint started. So for a lot of tuples, they may not get modified, so you never have to create that second version. Right? The checkpoint thread can always find the old version. But anytime I update something, I have to create a new one. So the only thing you need to do is just put a little bit, uh, flip a bit in the flag in the header of the tuple to say, this thing was created after a checkpoint. And then when the checkpoint fin as the checkpoint scan goes along, if it finds a tuple that has this, this bit set to zero, it knows it's the thing it should read. If it has one that's set to one, then it knows it should ignore it, then flip it to zero and keep scanning. Right, because there's only one checkpoint thread running, doing a scan on, on one particular tuple at a time. Right, and then cleans up the old version as it goes along. So this is a really simple approach that solves the problem of having to lock the entire uh, system while, while we take a checkpoint. I think, I think this is actually, uh, if in, in a Volta environment, I think this is the right way to do this. Okay, so what are some of the issues we have with these approaches? Well, the transactions, in the case of naive snapshots, uh, we may have to wait for the networking of uh, the checkpoint thread to complete uh, before we, we can actually start running. Like the naive checkpoints is literally just lock the entire table, copy it out, and then write it out and let other uh, let everyone else keep running after you're done. Um, so that's bad. And then the case of we're doing uh, copy on update uh, with with depending on what current code scheme we're doing, we may have to acquire latches in order to read something. But the checkpoint threads gonna acquire those latches too, so we would get blocked on that, All right? So these are the this is the problem that they're trying to solve in the in the paper you guys read with these two different approaches, uh, the wait free zigzag and the wait free ping pong. So the first thing to point out is that when I say wait free, I don't mean lock free or latch free. It really just means that the the worker threads are never gonna have to wait for the checkpoint thread to start a finish, uh, whenever they want to update the database. Right, there'll be some pauses we'll see in some of these cases where, where we have to maybe update some metadata about the copy of the, of, of the, of the, of the database we're trying to deal with, we're trying to flip, to flip from one copy to the next, but at runtime, as we're taking the checkpoint, we, we're, ne we're never blocked by anybody. And so in the case of wait for you zigzag, what they're gonna do is they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna make a trade-off that uh, instead of having to have a single copy of the database or a, or a multi-version database, they're always going to have explicitly two copies. And then what will happen is when a transaction starts updating, once updated the database, we'll have some way to figure out which of these two copies we want to write to, and the other copy is essentially what the checkpoint thread is, is reading and writing out to disk. And the way they're going to do this is that they're going to have these bitmaps that basically says uh, when a transaction shows up, which version or which copy of, of the database should it read and write from, right? And, they're, and they're gonna, the argument that they make is that Yes, having two copies suck because uh, you're, you're spending, you know, wasting more space and memory. But this is better than having to co any copy on updates because the the you know for it's not something you have to keep repeating over and over again. You oh, you don't have to malloc every single time you have to make a new version. You've already malloc a giant you know block of space at, at the beginning. So this so let's go through an example like this. All right, so say we have two copies of the database. Uh, and then we have our two bitmaps. So for this example, I'm just showing you uh, these, these, these sort of vectors of, of single digits, right, for simplicity reasons. But again, think of these could be, will be tuples, right, and like multi-attribute tuples. For our purposes, it, it, it can just be single numbers. So the first thing we see is that the, uh, we have our read bitmap and our write bitmap, and the offset in this corresponds to an offset in the, in the fixed, length, uh, fixed length data arrays for the actual tuples. So the read bitmap is going to tell us which one we should read from. And so if it's zero, we read from the first copy. If it's one, we re read from the second copy. And the write bitmap is the same thing. If it's zero, we write to the first one. If it's uh, one, we write to, to the second one. So say we have now, at the very beginning, uh, we, we want to start taking a checkpoint. So the checkpoint thread is going to look at the write bitmap. And it's going to figure out, use this to figure out what it should read from. So essentially what it's going to do is going to invert the bitmap. And for every single, for every single uh, slot in the bitmap, it's going to invert the value. So if it's, if it's 1, it goes to 0. If it's 0, it goes to 1. And that's going to tell it 
where it needs to need to read from. So in this case here, at the very beginning, write bitmap started off as one. So our checkpoint thread is going to read from uh, it's, when it does the inversion, everything goes to zero. So therefore, it should take a checkpoint by just scanning through the first copy. So again, so it's, we, we do the inversion. That tells us where we need to go. And then now we start scanning through. And then for every single element we find in our list, we start writing that out. Now, say at the same time while the checkpoint's running, uh, our transaction comes along and wants, wants to do an update. So for this, I'm ignoring concurrency control entirely. Right? Assume that there's some higher level scheme or protocol that the database system is running that's telling you whether a transaction is allowed to, to read or write something. Right? So for our purposes here, assume that this, you know, two phase locking doesn't matter, that the, the database system says it's, it's OK for this thing to read this. So the thing we want to do here is we want to make sure that when we do our writes, we don't end up writing into the, uh, the, 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 the slots or the, 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 the data elements that the checkpoint thread is reading from. Because we don't want it to see any of our updates, because the, the checkpoint needs to be consistent. So we go in here, and we look. So this transaction wants to update uh, the first people, and then the the the, the and the, the third and the fourth. So the write bitmap is set to one. So we're going to know that we want to do our write uh, in, in here. So we go ahead and apply our update. We can commit and do whatever else we need to do, and we're fine. Um, we also now need to also flip the, these bits in the read bitmap. So, so that if anybody comes along behind us, they know that now they want to read from the second copy, not the first copy. So again, I'm being hand wavy about the concurrent control scheme of this, but you can think of this as this transaction has an exclusive lock on these tuples. Uh, so that means no one can read this uh, until we act we're actually done with it, until we release those locks. So it's OK that we're doing this in multiple steps. right? So we could, we could do this read here. We already have exclusive locks, so no one's going to flip this on us. We apply our update here, and then we can apply the update here, and that's all done atomically because there's some higher level protection mechanisms going on. All right, so there, transaction commits, and then our checkpoint is, is done. So now you immediately want to switch over and now start doing another checkpoint, right? So we just keep doing this over and over again. So the same thing as before. The checkpoint thread is going to look at the write bitmap, and that's going to tell it where, where it wants to read from. But before we, before we do that inversion, we actually want to apply the updates from the read bitmap and invert whatever value we have in here and set that to be in, in the write bitmap. So the last, in the last checkpoint round, the, the transaction updated these three tuples. So we set this thing to 1. So now in our write bitmap, we want to set this to 0. So that in our checkpoint, uh, we invert this. So now this is telling us we, sh we should read from 1, right? because that's where the, the last update uh, from the previous transaction came from. So now our checkpoint thread will basically again scan through this. And now you see why it's called zigzag, because for some of these elements, it's going to get from, th from this one, then it's going to go here, and then it's going to go here, and, and back and forth. So as it's scanning down, it knows how to zigzag back and forth and make sure that we now have, it's, it's guarantees that it's a consistent snapshot. So is this clear? OK. So say now again, we have another transaction comes along. Same as before, wants to do an update. Same thing. We, we find where, we, we use the right bitmap to tell us where we need to write. And then we do our write, flip the read bitmap, and we're done. So in the next checkpoint, we'll make sure that we get our updates. So the, the big problem we're going to have with this is that when we do, uh, when we're back here, before we start at the next checkpoint, we needed to update the write bitmap atomically, right? Because we don't, because again, we're not, we have other transactions that could be running at the same time. And they may start, start flipping around the, these bits on us. So to make sure that we have a consistent snapshot in memory of the new, what the, the correct bitmap should be, we have to protect this thing with a latch. So there'll be a long pause, potentially, uh, that no other transactions can actually run, even though they may, may acquire locks or tuples, whatever, in, in, the, in the higher levels of the current control system. We have to lock them out in order to do this update atomically. So there'll be this big pause after every checkpoint where we block all transactions in order to, uh, to update the bitmap. So this is the problem that the, uh, the wait-free ping pong is trying to solve. So these guys are going to trade, make a trade-off that they're going to give, uh, they're going to sacrifice extra memory and CPU overhead to avoid that long pause at the end of a checkpoint. And the way they're going to do this is that they're going to basically now three copies of the database. 
So you're going to have two copies that you're going to flip back and forth as the, as the master and the shadow. And then you're going to have a third copy called the base copy where you're always sort of storing the, the latest version of the, of the database. And what happens is, again, the pointer says which one's the, the current master, which, which one's the, 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 the shadow. And then at the end of the checkpoint, you just flip those, that pointer, doing compare and swap, and that's the only update you have to do, and you don't have to block anybody to make this happen. So let's go through an example of this. This one's a little bit more complicated, but it should be pretty easy to follow. All right, so again, we have our, uh, our base copy, and then we have our uh, two, two, two you know, copies we're going to flip back and forth. And then we down below here, we have our pointer for, the, for the, what's considered the, the master and what's the shadow. So at the very beginning, we see that the, the current master is copy one, uh, and this is what we're going to use to, to start writing our changes to. And then the shadow copy is where we're going to want to take our checkpoint, and this is going to have an exact copy of the uh, what's in the base copy uh, over here. And then these, these bits are basically going to tell us whether we've, we've modified this during this checkpoint round. So if our transaction comes along, our, our checkpoint thread can just scan through this and write that out, and no one's going to be modifying this while we're doing this, so it, it, it's guaranteed to be consistent. And then now if our, checkpoint, or our transaction comes along and starts updating things, and say it wants to update these, uh, these three elements, it's going to make the change in both the base copy and the uh, current master copy. And when it does the change in the master copy, it's going to flip that bit to one to say that I've modified this. right? And if you're doing a read, you can always read from the base copy because this is always going to be guaranteed to be the correct version you should read. Right? So now let's say that our, uh, our checkpoint thread finishes. Um, and so before we switch over to have a new master and a new shadow, what we need to do is go through now in our uh, current shadow, and we got to flip all these bits to zero to tell them that, all right, we're, we're going to get ready for doing writes in here. And I set it to zero so that when I do a write, I can flip it to one to know that I actually wrote to it. Now, I'm also showing that we're essentially clearing out the contents of memory of what was in here before. For our purposes, I mean, for simplicity reasons, this is fine. Uh, you don't actually have to do this because you're never actually going to read uh, from the from the checkpoint sorry, from 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 the from the master. Right? You can always read from the base copy, so it doesn't matter that it got got flipped to zero or flipped to empty. Yes. Like hearing this, it, it kind of like reminds me of like garbage collection almost. Is that a valid comparison? Like at a high level, or is that so his statement is this reminds me of garbage collection. Um, so I, I think so. I think what you're trying to say is like. Um, I mean, it's not really like maybe there's just in your view nothing, but it's just like vaguely reminding. Yeah, but in, in garbage collection, like it's sort of like that. Like, it's sort of like yes, it's sort of like the epoch management stuff where you're trying to be clever about what's visible and make sure people don't see things that they shouldn't see. And that's part certainly true. Um, and the main thing I want you to get out of this is like, this is a terrible idea because there's three copies of the database. <laughs> but here's a way to do it. If you want to make this thing truly non-blocking or weight free, here's a way to do it. But you pay a big penalty because you make three copies. But like in general, like checkpointing and garbage collection are like not very overlapping problems. So his statement is, is checkpointing and garbage collection not overlapping problems? So. The way to sort of think about it is like a, when you take a checkpoint, if you're using MVCC, you just turn off garbage collection, right? At least for anything that, that while your checkpoint thread is done, you know, it should be able to see, right? Uh, as far as I know, nobody is clever about things like if my checkpoint's going to take an hour and there's no other transaction other than the checkpoint that could be, is reading the versions in between the checkpoint one and the latest version, could I prune those things out? No one does that as far as I know. Yeah, so so it, you're you're right that there there are there is a bit of a symbiotic relationship between the two of them, but uh, they're usually treated as sort of separate beasts. Yeah. All right. So uh, so now again, I'm gonna I'll do my flip here. The copy two now becomes the, the new master. Copy one is is the shadow, and so uh, my checkpoint thread wants to read this thing and write this thing out. But now, what's the problem here? It's missing data, right? Because when, I, when, when this was the old master, I only updated three tuples and I didn't have the old versions in there. 
So you could say, all right, well, maybe try to get these, these, the, the values I'm missing from the base copy, but this is a race condition because now someone could, be up, could have updated this and uh, or I, go check, I would go check here. This is still zero, so I know that this is the latest version. And by the time I go check zero and go copy this into me, someone had kind of updated this, right? And the only way to protect myself is to set a latch. But I said we didn't want to do that because we want this thing to be weight free. So we can't do that. And so what they proposed, which I think is, when I read the paper, I was like, oh, I did not see that coming. Um, what they proposed to do, the way to fill in these, these, these missing values here is that you actually go back to disk for the last checkpoint you did. And because it's a consistent snapshot, a consistent checkpoint, you know it's going to have all the values. So you look on disk of that file you just wrote out and go read back in the values that you're missing. And then you write that back out to disk, right? It works. Uh, yeah. But again, so, so, so you have to do this because otherwise you take, take locks to protect things. And they didn't want to do that. So her question is, what about the first checkpoint you have nothing on a disk? You're here. So you have the base copy, and then the, 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 the shadow copy will have, a, has to have exact copy of everything. All right. You know, alternatively, you could, if you want to do delta checkpoints, you could just skip these things. But again, as I said, you have to manage that on recovery to put it back in the correct state. Yes? Just an interesting thought. What if these copies are not like in memory, but replicas on different in a cluster. So basically your bitmap will be a load balancer and that'll shoot it to the right machine. Does, does that sort of solve the copying problem? So his statement is don't think of these these copies as being all in memory on the same node. Think of them as as a, as a separate nodes in a, in a distributed environment. And that the bitmap is stored at a sort of centralized query router or, or load balancer that can then figure out which one you should actually go to. And does it solve what problem? Yeah, so that's actually a good point. So, so he's like, well, what if I'm what if I'm in a distributed environment where I want to have copies anyway? Can I just use this approach? I'd have to think about that. Um, so certainly, I don't think anybody does this. Would do, does that, right? You, usually, everyone like updates the like sends the op log for replica, replication. Yeah, I, I, I have to think about that. All right, so the so all, so all, for these these different implementations, um, the paper brings out what are the actual low level primitives you need to do to really build any checkpoint mechanism in in, in a database system. And again, there's another reason I like this paper, even though the idea is a bit far fetched. I think they do a good job of laying out like what does it mean to actually build a, a checkpointing scheme in a database system. So. The four different primitives we can use are essentially doing bulk state copying, and as we saw in the case of naive checkpoints, again, you're just copying data that you need, and then make sure that it's consistent, and then you can write that out. You can use low-level locks and latches to isolate the checkpointing thread from the worker threads as they modify the, the, the database. You can do the bitmap schemes, as in the zigzag approach, where you can do bulk up, up updates or bulk resets for the bitmap that you're using to keep track of the dirty regions in, your, in the database. And then when, you, when the checkpoint finishes, you reset everything and then take the next checkpoint. Right? And this allows you to figure out what has actually, actually been modified since the last checkpoint you took. And the last one, as we saw in the previous example, where you just copy a lot more, more you just maintain more copies and uh, avoid having to synchronize the writes across those copies um, until you actually you know, finish the checkpoint. So this table here is a sort of summary of all the different approaches we, we see. Um, and so the, thing, the only thing I'll sort of, main thing I'll point out is in case of memory usage, for the naive snapshots to copy on updates, it says they're 2x, but think of this as like 2x in the worst case, right? Uh, in the case of the VoltDB scheme, where I was switching to the copy and write mode, and then uh, you know, anytime I update things, I have to make a new copy. In the worst case scenario, if, if I have you know, 100 tuples, and all 100 tuples get modified uh, during the checkpoint, then yes, it would be 2x. In practice, it's not going to be that case. Question? I'm worried on copy and write. Uh, copy and update to be two consecutive modified by the same tuples. Did you make two copies? In, in the VoltDB scheme? or, or So VoltDB is single threaded. So only one transaction could ever run at a time could be accessing a tuple. So if a, uh, 
if the first transaction updates the tuple and you make a new copy, the second the second transaction doesn't run to the first guy runs to the first guy commits. Second guy runs. If he updates the same tuple, you just overwrite the second copy, right? So there's only ever two copies. Um, and, again, and then the wait for you zigzag and the wait for you ping pong, right? These are definitely two x overhead, three x overhead for each of these, right? All right. So in the remaining time, I want to then talk about to sort of another idea of checkpoints again, which I really like, um, is using them to solve a different problem than just recovery. So again, everything so far has been about, you know, if I crash, I, how do I load my checkpoint back in? Oh, and what, what's in my checkpoint? But in this, maybe the case that we're not just restarting the data system because there was a crash, right? Or someone tripped over the power cord. Um, people restart databases all the time, right? especially in production environments. Uh, and you have to do things like, you know, update, update your, your operating system to put new you know, security patches in. Uh, if you buy new hardware, like you're going to put more RAM in or upgrade your EC2 instance, you have to shut the system down and bring it back up. Um, and it's also very common if you want to update the actual software itself, you want to, you know, you have to stop it and, and restart it. So the, the problem we're going to try to solve here uh, is, is this last one. How can we deal with the case that we want to update the data system software, uh, which, again, when you shut the system down, you have to take a checkpoint. How can we have the, the restart time be really fast uh, by trying to avoid having to go to, go to disk? And the reason why Facebook wants to solve this problem is because they have this sort of uh, you know, development philosophy where it's an agile environment, or so they say, where they're always pushing out updates every, or new releases for their software services every two to three weeks. And so if you have a database system and you're putting out updates every two or three weeks, Every two or three, three weeks, you have to restart your, your system. But now, if you're, if you're running on a system with a, you know, a thousand nodes, and it takes you two hours to, to restart a node and load, load the last checkpoint in, then a large portion of your fleet will be down for extended period of times every, every two or three weeks. And so the way they're going to solve this is that they're going to essentially decouple the, the contents of the, the database in memory from the lifetime or the, or, the, or the life of the database system process itself. So again, this should be operating system 101. I malloc a bunch of memory in my process. My process ends. The operating system takes that memory away. If I come back and restart the exact same process, you know, exact same binary, the operating system doesn't know it's the same thing, and all the memory you malloc is gone. You have to do it all over again. So in their environment, again, if you're if you're you have to take a checkpoint to stop the database system, you want to turn it back on, and when you want that in-memory database to still be there. And so the way they're going to solve this problem is through shared memory. So what's going to happen is they're going to write out, the, they're going to have the database be stored in shared memory, and then they stop the process. They write a little file that says, if, here's the address location in shared memory where, where I took my checkpoint. Then you turn the data system back on. It looks in that file, looks in the memory address, sees it in shared memory, see whether that the data is still there. If so, now it has the database that the last process had. Right? And that's going to allow you restarts way, way faster because everything's already in memory. Right? So now the question is, how are we actually going to do this? So the system they're doing this for is a system called Scuba. And I'm sure someone will email me and tell me that I'm wrong. But as far as I know, it's still used in, in production. Um, it's a distributed in-memory database system that they use for uh, analysis of uh, the data that they collect for all their services. And the idea here is that all their you know, various services and web apps that they have, they're generating these log files. They process the log files and, the, and, 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 and to these events, and they write them out into uh, to Scuba. So now you can do tracing, like for a single HTTP request, what all the different layers of the, the, the application stack I had to go through, and what was the timing for all of these. So you can use that to figure out if I put out a new service, does, is it slower today than it was yesterday? And that's what Scuba. That's the problem Scuba is trying to solve. So as I said in the beginning, this is not a course on distributed databases. This will probably be the only distributed database we actually really really talk about. Um, I think it's worth mentioning a little bit because it'll get you to understand what they're actually trying to do, the problem they're trying to solve a little bit better. So Scuba is going to have a heterogeneous architecture. It's a shared nothing system. And by heterogeneous, I mean like within a single cluster for a database instance, some nodes will be tasked to do some things and other nodes will be tasked to do other things. So some nodes will be called leaf nodes. And this is actually where the data is actually stored in memory. And these are in charge of doing like the scans and the filters on the, the raw tables themselves. And then they, then they generate results and they push them up into aggregator nodes 
that will combine these results from multiple uh, leaf nodes and then do whatever aggregation or group by or whatever computation join you want to do on that and then shove up the answer to, to the client. So it sort of looks like this. Again, you have some root aggregator node and then you have middle ag aggregation nodes and then you have your leaf nodes. So if I have a single query that needs to touch all these nodes, I'll break it up into four pieces and these guys all push it down. The leaf nodes do their scan, generate their output, shove it up to the aggregation node. He then combines it and then moves it on to the next guy. Right, this is actually a very uh, standard approach that uh, Facebook uses for a lot of their distributed systems. Um, the founder of MSQL, after he spent some time at, at, at Microsoft seeing the SQL Server stuff, then he went to go at Facebook and spent a little time there and saw, I guess, essentially how to do this. And this is essentially how MemSQL works as well. Right? So again, what we're talking about is the leaf nodes down here. The aggregation nodes are stateless. There's, they have no data. So if these guys die, who cares? You just bring them back and they just pick up where they left off. All the state is stored down here. So we want to be able to restart these guys very quickly um, without having to read the checkpoint entirely from, from disk. So there's two approaches you can do this, two ways to do this. The first is essentially you write your own version of malloc that instead of allocating memory from the, from the, the private address space heap of your process, you malloc or allocate it in shared memory. So Facebook owns or bought or hired the guy that wrote GE malloc, which is an awesome uh, memory allocator. We use that in our system. Uh, and they had him try to figure out whether this actually would work. And so the GE malloc guy basically said that uh, this won't work because you have to make major changes to your memory allocator to use shared memory because you have to do things like subdivide memory up um, for thread safety and scalability. Um, there's other issues too where like uh, the the... The, in shared memory, all the, the, the memory you allocate has to be backed by physical pages immediately, right? So if you malloc in, in your heap, uh, the operating system will say you have that memory, but it hasn't actually not mapped, it hasn't mapped that virtual memory to physical memory yet. But in shared memory, it has to do that immediately, right? So this would be really slow because every single time you malloc memory, if I need two gigs, but I, uh, if I malloc two gigs, but I only need 1K now, you gotta, you gotta get, actually get, really get two gigs. So what they said was, that'll make the blooper real, that's all right. Uh, but they said instead of, instead of doing it on the fly for your shared memory heaps, instead what you're going to do is when the system is going to shut down, right, because again, we're doing, we're doing software updates. So we know that we're going to restart the system. So, we, so it's a sort of, it's a cordial process. We tell the system, hey, we're shutting down. So when this happens, they're going to copy all the contents of the heap for the database out of local memory into shared memory and then when we restart, we know how to come back and find that, that data and bring it back in, right? So, oh, sorry. So again, the, the, the administrator says, I'm going to do a shutdown, and then immediately the system is going to start, stop ingesting new information. So what, again, while it's actually doing, doing queries for the analytical stuff, it's actually taking uh, uh, these streams of new updates coming in. So we stop ingesting any, anything. And then now we have, we have a consistent, snap, consistent snapshot of the database for, for us. And then we start writing all our data out to the heap, essentially just doing scans on, on, on our tables. And every single time we get a tuple, we copy it into shared memory and then delete it from our, our local memory. And then when we're done, we restart the system, uh, boot back up, and check, check this you know, again, the special file that tells us whether we have a copy of the database in shared memory. If so, then we just do the process of, uh, of you know, doing this scan again and copying from shared memory and putting it back into our regular database. Um, there's some extra stuff you have to do uh, to make sure that the, you're reading compatible data, right? So if, if, the, if from one version to the next, if the, the layout of memory changes for your data, you don't want the system to boot back up and think it actually has you know, things it can comprehend. So you'd want to throw an error or stop the, you know, don't recover from the shared memory if you know that it's an incompatible version. So there's a bunch of extra checks they have to put in place to make sure that they know they're reading valid data, right? So again, I really like this because it's like the hyper example we showed before when we're doing the forking snapshots. It's sort of relying on another uh, aspect of the operating system or a feature that the operating system provides to make our database life easier. Um, I'm extremely interested in shared memory. Uh, or try to use it for other things. We talked about doing huge pages before, uh, and I said it was a bad idea to run this in your database process with huge pages because not everything needs to be you know one gigabyte page sizes. 
Turns out what you can do with shared memory, you can have shared memory have different page sizes as your regular heap memory. So maybe we could put some things in the database on huge pages in shared memory. It's not really shared because no other thread, no other process is going to access it. Um, but then we get another heap space allocated with, with different uh, page sizes. So I think shared memory is actually really cool, and it's not something that people actually have really investigated in memory databases that we could look into later. But anyway, so the main thing here is, again, it's this basic uh, functionality that the operating system provides, and they're using it in a really clever way to solve a problem. Okay. So what are the main takeaways of this? So I think, in my opinion, and it should, should be obvious to you, and I think I've said this multiple times during today, uh, the copy on update checkpoints is, is the, the best way to do this. And this is pretty much what everyone does. Uh, and if you're doing multi-version concurrency control, it's super easy because you just, you know, you just take, you know, treat the, the checkpoint as a che transaction that has a snapshot in time, and you just scan everything and write everything out. And the question of whether you want to need delta checkpoints or complete checkpoints I think that is, uh, that's actually an un unsolved question. I think Microsoft does it a really good way, um, but I'm not sure why nobody else does this. Like in HANA, for example, those guys have oodles of money. Uh, they could have done Delta checkpoints like Microsoft, but they didn't. So I, I, don't, know, I don't know why that, that's the case. Um, and then of course at the end it said shared memory has some use, use after all. All right, so any questions? In the back, yes. All right, so good point. So his question is, for all the checkpoint schemes we talked about here, do we need Aries? Do we need like multiple passes over the log? No. Unless you're doing fuzzy checkpoints. If you have a consistent checkpoint, uh, all you need to do is, is, is load the last checkpoint, uh, then jump to that place in the log and uh, replay the... Um, Figure out what transactions were running at the time you were taking the checkpoint. Maybe go back a little bit farther and find where they start, and then just replay everything after that. Right? Uh, to do it the silo way, going in reverse order, uh, you still load the last checkpoint, and then you go in reverse order and apply all the changes. Right? Uh, and you make sure that anything, again, any transaction that committed, committed after the checkpoint, but started before the checkpoint, you go back as far as you need to go to make sure you get, you get them as well. So you don't need to do, again, in an in database, we don't need to undo undo if we're doing consistent checkpoints because there's no uncommitted transaction changes written to the checkpoint. Makes, is that clear? OK, yes? Does shared memory require like, locks? This question is, does shared memory require locks? Or scope, I just use it as a, like, a storage medium without locks. Yeah, so, yeah so, so, so shared memory is useful for sharing memory, as it says, uh, across processes. So Postgres does this. So you have to use locks to present, prevent other processes from making changes that the other person sh shouldn't see. Now, in the case of the SCUBA case, SCUBA system, the system's shutting down. It's a, it's a single process anyway. It's just, it's just piggybacking the fact that it can restart the database process and have shared memory still stick around. Right, so it doesn't have to do any locks because nobody else could be modifying the shared memory at the same time. Right now, you may have multiple threads writing into shared memory regions in the same process, and that you have to protect with latches. But there's again, we're not coordinating with any other transactions. In general, again, if you have multi processes, then you have to put your locks in shared memory. If you're a single process writing to shared memory with multiple threads, then you just do the regular latching scheme that you, you did before. Uh, so his question is, if, since Facebook's trying to save on downtime, do they actually rebuild the indexes, or do they uh, actually save them as well? Actually, I don't know. Um, I actually don't know whether they even have indexes. It's still a lot of stuff. Right? It's still a lot of stuff, so you may actually need it. But it, it's a time series database, so oftentimes you want, uh, you want index to be able to jump to different points in time. They might have something like that. I, I don't know the answer. But there's no reason they couldn't. Right? right? It's easy. All right, any other questions? All right, cool. So next class, uh, this will be a new lecture that I haven't given before. Um, I'm super interested in networking protocols because we support GDBC. Some of the students, some of you people here in the audience have lost you know, hair, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever, like trying to get GDBC to work correctly. 
And so uh, we should actually you know, spend some time to actually understand what it is. So the paper you guys are going to read actually is from ODB, And they, they basically show how uh, JDBC or the wire protocols for, for databases are inefficient for moving bulk data around. Um, but it get, it'll get you to understand what these protocols actually do. OK? All right, any questions? All right, guys, enjoy the warm weather, and I'll see you on Monday. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, playing waves are quicker Rhymes I create, rotate at a rate Too quick to duplicate, fill a breeze, have a skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight When I'm in flight, then we ignite Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turn with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off, with St. Ives